Hello, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Hilary Geiser. I'm an optometrist and assistant, per assistant professor of optometry at the New England College of Optometry. And today I'm presenting part two of my lecture on introduction to binocular vision testing. In my last lecture, I covered introductory um, binocular vision testing procedures. And today we're gonna look at um, common binocular vision disorders and uh, the signs and symptoms um, that you would find with these. Again, I'd just like to thank the Orbis team for allowing me the opportunity to present these lectures and for the help of Dr. Sarah Wozniak and Dr. Katherine Johnson for their um, part in the making of these lectures. So today's lecture objectives is to identify the compensating virgins for all types of fours and predict if a patient's likely to be symptomatic based on shards. We traced a touch base on shards in my previous lecture, wanted to touch base on that again today. Hopefully you'd be able to predict the uh, effect of a prescription on ocular alignment using the ACA ratio. This is very useful when we're thinking about what to prescribe in clinic. And how to calculate the amps when the amps are measured through something other than the best distance refraction. Say a patient has a large change of prescription, how is that going to change their amplitude of accommodation? And then we're going to go through Dwayne White and accommodative diagnoses. We're going to provide cases and we're going to classify um, into the different categories. And we're also going to look at the different accommodative and um, diagnoses and predict the findings for these. So hopefully at the end of the day, you'll have a better understanding of binocular vision disorders. So some review um, for those of you who might have not seen my first lecture, just going to go through a quick a review of aphorias and virgins. So everyone has the aphoria that has the potential to become symptomatic or potentially develop into atropia. We call this a decompensated phoria. And what pre prevents that phoria be from becoming symptomatic or decompensating? That really is our balance between our fusional supply and demand. Our fusional demand is the phoria at a given working distance. That's what our demand is. That's what our eyes, um, their natural position is. And what do we have to compensate? That's known as our fusional supply our fusional virgins ability, um, and just note that our accommodation can also add to that supply. So for positive fusional virgins, compensates for exophoria, eyes are out, we need to bring them in, and we test this with face out prism like I explained in my previous lecture. Negative fusional virgins is the opposite. It compensates for our eyes being in, and we need negative fusional virgins to compensate, and we test that with face in prisms. Just to um, note that patients, even if you're ortho, you still need some supply of fusional virgins in order to function comfortably. And it's just always important that we're comparing aphorias and virgins that are measured at the same working distance. We don't want to compare distance phoria to near phoria through the same prescription. If we want to test a new prescription, that's great. We just need to do our testing with perhaps the habitual and then retest with our new prescription. And then just consider the, the norms and guidelines. So this is just the um, review of the normative data. This is adapted from Scheinman and Wick a useful handy chart to have in clinic. So to review Sherrod's criterion, what is Sherrod's criterion? This is a guideline that states that our compensating fusional virgins should be at least twice the FOIA for comfortable single vision. We use our blur finding. We can use break if there's no blur and we're gonna compare our virgin's findings to the FOIA. So for example, if the base out to blur is twice the exo FOIA, then our eyes are out, we need positive fusional virgins to bring them in. We're gonna protect comfortable single vision, and the opposite is true for ESO. If we're, patient, we're gonna need at least twice that base into blur of the FOIA to predict comfortable single vision.
So here's just an example. So when we did our cover testing without correction, we found a two prism diopter exophoria at distance and a nine prism diopter exophoria at near. Our step vergences without correction were base in um, no blur 2018 and for base out we found 24, 30, and 26. So is the FOIA within the normal range? No, it's not. What's our compensating fusional virgins for exophoria? That's base out. But is Schertz criteria met? Yes. So we need at least 18 compensating base out, which we do. We have 24. So even though the patient has a FOIA that's outside the normal range, they're likely not going to be symptomatic because they have an adequate supply of positive fusional virgins to compensate for their exophoria. Just going to go through a second example here. Cover test, we found similar um, findings, exact same findings as in the previous example, two prism diopter exo at distance and nine prism diopter exo at near. Our step vergences are as follows for near base N, we found no blur, break at 20, recovery at 18, and for our base out, we found 11 blur, 13 break, and seven recovery. So again, abnormal foria. In this case, Schertz criteria is not met. We have nine, we need at least 18 in order to function comfortably, we have 11 for our base out. So our patient's likely going to be symptomatic. So you can see in these two cases how we're looking at what, we, what the demand is, what the FOIA position is, and what we have to compensate. In the previous example, the patient would be able to function most likely comfortably. In the second example, they're not, and we'd have to treat them appropriately. A review again of ACA ratio. We're going to look at both the FOIA's compensating version, vergences and ACA ratios today when we're doing the cases. So I just wanted to give you a quick refresher if you were unable to view my previous lecture. So ACA is accommodative convergence to accommodation. So we determine the change in accommodative convergence that occurs when the patient increases or decreases their accommodation by a given amount. They're looking at a target here. We're using plus and minus one flippers and we're reassessing the FOIA, and examining how that FOIA position changes. And that's looking at just how strong is that link between accommodation and convergence. Here's an ACA ratio example for our refraction. We found minus two in both the right eye and left eye. So we then did our cover testing through that minus two and found a four prism after ectophoria. We repeated with that with plus one in this case and found a six exo. That plus is going to make that exo a little bit larger. We're able to calculate the difference. The difference between four and eight is four. So our ACA ratio is four to one. So our convergence decreased by four prism diopters when the stimulus to accommodation was decreased by one. So we have our ACA ratio. What's the normative data um, for ACA ratio? Just to refresh, normal is about four to one to six to one. Low is under four to one and high is over six to one. So what's the clinical application of this ACA ratio? So first of all, it helps us classify our binocular vision anomalies. Um, so we need to look at that, either high or low. What does that mean? We can also use the ACA value to predict the effect of a prescription on a patient's alignment, and this helps us decide what to prescribe. Um, do they have a high ACA ratio? What kind of prescription do they have? Do they have minus or plus? And how is that going to change their FOIA position if we would need to change that prescription by a small or large amount? So when asymptomatics present with a normal FOIA and you're finding a large change in prescription and their ACA is high, it's highly re recommended to recheck that FOIA with a new prescription to make sure you're not going to make the patient symptomatic. You don't want to take a normally functioning patient 
give them a new pair of glasses and then have them back in your office unhealthy because they're uncomfortable. This is particularly important in the case of esophorias when prescribing minus. Minus is going to stimulate the convergent system and it's going to make them, our eyes go in, it's going to make that eso worse. Opposite for exophores, when a patient exophoric and you're prescribing plus, that plus is going to relax convergence, going to make their exo potentially worse if they have a high ACA ratio. So these are the cases we need to be careful, esos with minus, exos with plus. However, if the situation's in reverse, we can often take advantage of that high ACA ratio, depending on the prescription, to help us. So say your patient's exo, they're myopic, we might leave them a little over minus because that's going to help them bring to stimulate their accommodative and convergent system and help bring their eyes in. So I have a couple examples here about ACA ratio and prescribing. So example one, on cover test uncorrected, we found a six prism diopter esophoria at near. They have a quite high ACA ratio we found of eight to one. So what would we predict? So if we predict that we put a plus one over their, um, over their eyes and remeasure that foria, we're going to expect a two prism diopter exophoria. That plus is going to relax accommodation convergence, make that exo worse. Um, and so they're going from six to two, that's our eight. And we're gonna expect them to land up about two XL. How about if we tested through a plus two flipper, we'd expect the XO to get worse by eight again. So now they're about a 10 XL. So just be mindful, this is a high ACA ratio, so be mindful that plus can potentially be a little helpful. Um, but minus would make that ESO worse. So depending on their prescription, just need to be aware of this. How about our example number two? This patient's also a six prism diopter ESO at near. They have slightly low ACA ratio, almost normal of three to one. So what would we predict? We predict that for you through that plus one, it's gonna make the ESO a little bit bigger. Um, yeah, and make, make the exo a little bit, um, we're going to relax the accommodation a little bit, we're going to end up around three eso, and then if we do this with plus two, they're going to end up around ortho. So again, we can see that um, a little bit of plus might help the patient, but minus would again make the patient more eso. Previous examples, what to think about, we might want to um, trial frame the new prescription with the preceding patient because they have a high ACA ratio, might not need to do it with this patient. So I'm just going to review amplitude of accommodation. I covered this in my preceding lecture. I also talked about it today, so I just wanted to quickly go through that with you again today. Purpose of amplitude of accommodate, measuring the amplitude of accommodation is to change the focus and response to a near stimulus. It's tested under monocular Conditions is just important to remember to record the first sustained blur. We're going to use an accommodative target that's one to two lines larger than the best corrected visual acuity. And we do this to the habitual correction. And this is something that we need to think about again if we're giving glasses um, is how that's potentially changing if we're, we're upping or lowering the prescription by a significant amount. And this also helps you make decisions about accommodative anomalies. So just to analyze, the amps are usually the same as long as the refractive error is equally corrected. We, we measure in centimeters, but we record in diopters. The prescription through the amp, which the amp is measured, affects the amp measurement. This is why you always need to start out with an up-to-date prescription before we do binocular vision testing. So for example, if we undercorrected their myopia, this potentially can overestimate the amplitude of accommodation. If we undercorrect hyperopia, that's gonna underestimate the amps. 
patients wearing an ad that's going to overestimate the amps. So if we've ruled out all these, ruled out that they're not undercorrected myopes, undercorrected hyperopes, they're, they're ads appropriate, and they're still having a low amp, then we can think about a potential accommodative disorder. Here's just walking through the math and a couple examples. Vitual prescription is a minus two. We measure the amps today through this prescription and we're finding five diopters. However, in today's distance refraction, we're finding a change of about a diopter, so now we're finding a minus three. So how is that gonna change the amps? So if we're starting with a minus two, today we're finding a minus three. Essentially, the patient in their older classes has almost a plus one add, if you wanna think about it that way. So we need to take that away. So we take away that one, and now their amps through their up-to-date prescription is four diopters. So that might necessarily be enough for doing the near work that they need to do. So we need to think about that when prescribing. Let's go on to example two. Habitual prescription is a plus one. Today's amps through that plus one are a six, but in reality, their up-to-date prescription is a plus three. So they're, under correct, they're an undercorrected hypro by almost two diopters. So what is that going to do to our amps? If we correct them fully at plus three, they're gaining two uh, plus two. So if we would retest the amps, we would expect eight diopters. So just thinking about this when you're prescribing, if you might need to prescribe an ad if all of a sudden they have more minus. And so just thinking about amps and how that um, Changes your prescriptions, potentially. So I'm just going to go into the classification systems of functional binocular vision anomalies. So what is a binocular vision anomaly for review? It's any non strabismus binocular vision anomaly or an accommodative anomaly, very common. By de definition, they are non-pathological, non-site threatening, but can have a significant impact on a patient's quality of life. Again, it's highly recommended to do a full dilated exam to rule out any ocular pathology, and we always must start out with an updated spectacle prescription. As you saw in some of my previous examples, it might look like a patient has an accommodative anomaly, then we put on the full spectacle prescription and things may change. So the disorders that I'm going to be going through today, um, I only have an hour with you. I'd love to go through um, even more, but this is what we're going to go through today, some of the more common disorders. I'm gonna to touch on convergence insufficiency or CI, also something called pseudo-CI. Convergence excess or CE, divergence insufficiency or DI, divergence excess DE, basic exophoria, basic esophoria, accommodative insufficiency, commonly abbreviated as AI, accommodative excess AE, and accommodative infacility. So I'm gonna to present to you today the Duane White classification system. So this is a quite simple um, classification system that uses patient's foria and ACA ratio to classify patients into different accommodative anomalies. So, but there's pros and cons with this in any system. So it's a very common approach. Um, again, allows you to classify binocular anomalies based on foria and ACA and then confirm the diagnosis and look at the compensating virgins' accommodation and interactions between the virgins and accommodation system. I'm also going to be, in addition to using these Dwayne White classification systems, going to be discussing some common accommodative anomalies. So the cons with this system is it doesn't address vertical anomalies, and it can be quite simplistic. There's often an overlap in conditions, Binocular vision disorders do not always fall cleanly into these categories. There's other systems, but it's a very easy introductory approach to binocular vision anomalies. So 
So we're going to be breaking problems down into either convergence or divergence problems. So kind of focusing more on near problems and distance problems, problems and any excesses or insufficiencies. So um, if the patient's coming in with complaints that sound more like near, we might focus more on convergence problems or looking more at convergence problems. And the opposite is true if they're coming in with what sounds like a potential divergence problem, we're gonna focus more on distance testing. Dwayne White classifies high ACAs as, any, as an excess and low ACAs as an insufficiency. So here's just a great basic flow chart when we're thinking about the patient's presentation, the signs, and how to classify these binocular vision anomalies. So first we're gonna look at, is the FOIA greater at distance or at near? If the answer is the FOIA is greater at near than at distance, and we're talking about the distance, the near FOIA and the distance FOIA being different by at least five prism diopters. So if it's distance, if the FOIA is greater at near than distance, and that FOIA is an ESO, and they have a high ACA ratio, we're gonna classify them as a potential convergence excess. Looking again, four is greater at near than distance. If the four is greater at near than distance, we're thinking there's a convergence problem. In this case, we're finding an exo, and the patient has a low ACA. We're thinking the patient might have a convergence insufficiency. So we're gonna go on to our divergence problems next here. In these conditions, the distance FOIA is now the problem, so the distance is greater than near. Again, our distance FOIA is different than our near by at least five prism diopters. If we're finding an ESO at distance and a low ACA ratio, we're thinking there might be a divergence insufficiency. On the flip side, if the FOIA at distance is greater than near, and we're finding EXO with a high ACA ratio, we're thinking potentially there's a divergence excess. So when we're looking here in our third category, distance equals near, this is more of our basic exophoria, basic esophoria, and this means our foria at distance is very similar to our foria at near, by within five prism diopters. So these are when it's greater than five prism diopters distance and near, and this is when they're about equal. So about, let's for example, say ortho and three, that's within that five um, prism diopters. Patient might be, we're gonna classify them either into a basic ESO or a basic EXO. So in all the Dwayne White anomalies, we're gonna find, so we're classifying, we're thinking about this, and now we're going in and measuring our compensating divergences to see if there's, to examine the problem in more depth. So in these anomalies, we're gonna be finding that our virgins, our compensating divergences are low in both excesses and insufficiencies. So exophorias are associated with low positive fusional virgences. The eyes are out, we're having trouble bringing them in. Our and ESOs, the eyes are in, low negative fusional virgins, and we're having trouble bringing the eyes out. If we're having phorias, and we're thinking back when I was talking about shirts, high compensating virgins are not a problem. We can have relatively high phorias. If we have the compensating virgins, we're likely not to have a problem. So we're gonna find compensating divergences that are typically lower in both cases, both for excesses and insufficiencies. So I'm gonna to touch base on the tests I've taught in my previous lecture. So we learned some tests of negative fusional divergences and I taught you base and step prisms for both distance and near. For tests of positive fusional divergence, I covered near point of convergence and base out step prisms. So just to review, I'm going to add in one more test today that's just going to help us with when we're thinking about these disorders. That test is called binocular and monocular accommodative facility testing with flippers. 
you may or may not be familiar with this. This just kind of helps us when we're thinking about cases and analyzing things. So the testing procedure we have, we typically have plus and minus two flippers, and we're gonna be testing the patient at 40 centimeters. The target is one to two lines lighter than the best corrected vis near visual acuity. And essentially you're gonna count the cycles per minute between, of flips between the plus and minus two portion. A cycle counts as clearing both the plus and minus sign. So you're gonna instruct the patient to read the line of letters and report when they're clear. You're gonna have them cover, it's clear. Gonna have them cover, it's clear. And you're gonna count the cycles of per minute. Um, you can do a full minute. I know people that do that. I do recommend doing probably 30 seconds in length of time and just doubling it. So the normative data I typically use is eight cycles per minute, plus or minus two. There is some research search that breaks things down into different age groups that you can look at um, finding you know, slightly different things in the eight to 12 and the 18 to 35 age group. So I highly encourage you to take a look at those studies if you're interested. So in addition to counting the cycles per minute for the BAF and MAF, um, also note if one side or the other is slower. So maybe a patient can get to those eight cycles per minute, but they're consistently always having trouble on the plus side. That might potentially indicate a problem, might indicate that they have trouble relaxing their accommodation. And so what does this help us do? So we do the test binocularly, and then we have a patient close an eyes, and then we do it monocularly as well. This helps us decide if there's a virgins problem or accommodative problem or potentially both. So if patient has a low facility or fails flippers on both the binocular and monocular tests, there's likely an accommodative problem. On the other hand, if there's low facility only on binocular but not monocular, there's a potential virgins problem. So if we're doing it binocularly, they're unable to do it, it's virgins, because when we repeat that monocularly, they're able to accommodate and compensate for the changes in the lens. So we know it's likely not an accommodative issue if they're fine monocularly, but if they're having trouble binocularly, it's a potential virgins problem. So this just kind of helps us pinpoint if it's virgins or accommodative issue. So I'm gonna to touch base on each of the different conditions. First, I'm gonna cover convergence insufficiency, commonly abbreviated as CI, one of the most common conditions when we're thinking about binocular vision anomalies. Symptoms in this disorder, frequent near point complaints, um, soreness, eye tiredness, asthenopia at near, intermittent blurry vision and or diplopia, Often our teachers, parents might be saying, oh, my kid appears to be a slow reader. They're having difficulty. Patient might report that the words move on a page. They might often have frontal headaches and the symptoms are worse at the end of the day. So these are some of the symptoms that your patients might be coming in with and you're thinking there might be a possible convergence insufficiency. So when we're looking at the signs, we're finding exophoria that's greater at near than distance and a low ACA ratio. Again, it's an insufficiency, so we typically find a low ACA ratio. They often might break down into an intermittent exotropia, particularly at the end of the day. One of the hallmark findings of CI is a receded near point of convergence particularly one that's more receded when using the red lens over the right eye, repeating the near point of convergence procedure, and more receded with repetition. They do poorly on tests of positive regional virgins at near, such tests as low base out at near, and they're going to most likely fail binocular accommodative facility and have trouble on the plus side of the flippers. The convergence insufficiency often presents with an, a, an additional accommodative insufficiency or an accommodative excess. So you might find these together. 
Convergence excess, same symptoms as, as convergence insufficiency, so we're going to have to rely on our testing to differentiate the two. The signs in convergence excess are an ESO that's greater at near than a distance, but with a high ACA ratio, it's an excess. So according to Dwayne White, we're going to find a large or a high ACA ratio. These patients are converging a little bit more than normal. So they're typically going to have a normal near point of convergence. And they're going to do poorly on tests of negative fusional virgins. So we're going to find low base and prism. They're also going to fail binocular accommodative facility. And these patients have trouble with the minus flippers. And we often find them presenting with an additional accommodative excess. In divergence insufficiency, we're having distance complaints, intermittent blur at distance, um, eye tiredness, eye strain, asthenopia at distance. Particularly, um, patients often complain of having trouble during night driving, motion sickness, things like this. When we're looking at our sign, we're finding esophoria that's greater at distance than at near. Again, this is a distance complaint. And they have a low ACA ratio. Again, it's an insufficiency. The ACA ratio is typically low. Frequently, they normally have a normal near point of convergence, and they do poorly on tests of negative fusional virgins at distance, so low base N. In divergence excess, they, um, patients frequently don't may not have complaints. They might have occasional diplopia, but that's rare because the eye tends to suppress. They might have phobia, photophobia, and cosmesis is often a concern. Patients might say, oh, I look bug-eyed, or my friends and family say, I look bug-eyed, my eyes are out, and, and that might be one of the, the symptoms or complaints. Looking at the signs, the exophoria is greater at distance than at near, then distance complaints, so you're expecting the foria to be worse at distance than at near, and it's an excess, so they're going to have a high ACA ratio. They might often have a large exotropia when looking far away, and they often can be associated with a V pattern exotropia or exophoria pattern. I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more depth later, later. And they have a normal near point of convergence. These patients do poorly on tests of positive fusional virgins at distance, and we're going to find low base out. So this is what I mean when you might see a V pattern XO, you might be doing EOMs and the eyes look full, extensive, smooth, accurate, and all of that. And then when they go up, all of a sudden you see the eyes go out. So it looks like a V, they're normal inferiorly, but when you're looking superiorly, the eyes look like they go out into a V, and this is known as a V pattern XO. So next we're gonna look at your basic exophoria. We have a combination of symptoms that are similar to convergence insufficiency or divergence excess. You can think of these as exosymptoms. Um, their eyes are out, they're having trouble coming in, things like that. Um, our clinical signs are an exophoria that is equal at distance and near, again, within that five prison doctor. So we're finding very similar exo distance near, typically also find a receded near point of convergence. And these patients do poorly on tests of positive fusional virgins, both at distance and at near. So you're gonna find low base out virgences, distance and near, typically fails binocular accommodative facility, and they're gonna have trouble with plus flippers. Basic esophore, again, gonna have those ESO symptoms, their eyes are in, they're gonna have a um, combination of symptoms that sound like a CE, convergence excess, or divergence insufficiency symptoms. Clinical signs, again, that esophore is gonna be similar at distance and at near, again, within that bi-prism diopter amount. These esophoric patients typically have a normal near point of convergence, and they do poorly on negative fusional virgins at both distance of near. Again, eyes are in, having trouble moving our eyes out. So we're going to find low basin virgences distance and near. 
they're going to likely fail binocular accommodative facility, and they're going to have trouble with minus flippers. They're already accommodating, already converging, can't really do anymore when we put those minus flippers in front of them. So I'm going to go into our accommodative conditions next. Frequent complaints are blur, eye strain at near. We we're looking at our signs for finding low amplitudes of accommodation. And they typically fail, they're gonna fail lenses on both, my, on both binocular and monocular accommodative facility, right? This is an accommodative issue. So they're gonna fail it on when we have both eyes open, binocularly and monocularly. They're gonna have difficulty with minus on the flippers, can't stimulate their accommodation, can't use that, and they're typically a little esophoric in here. So this is a great time to touch base on something called pseudo-CI or pseudo-convergence insufficiency. So your patient's coming in, they're having complaints. It sounds like a convergence insufficiency. So you go to evaluate that. You're finding an exo that's greater at near than distance. And that near point of convergence is receded. And you're thinking, oh, my patient has convergence insufficiency. But then you know that symptoms appear to improve with plus lenses. And this doesn't make sense, right? So what's going on? So what's happening is, those low plus lenses are giving the accommodative system kind of a kickstart, if you want to think about it that way. That's going to help activate our accommodation. Once that accommodative convergence system is stimulated, we're going to reduce our XO. That's going to reduce our demand on fusion convergence. So the root of the problem isn't CI, it's accommodative insufficiency, right? And when we're using the plus lenses, we're helping out that accommodative facility. And then things, if we retest with some plus, look normal. So it's just really important that whenever you suspect convergence and sufficiency based on your cover, based on your cover test, near point of convergence, just always make sure to quickly test through plus one to rule out accommodative insufficiency or what I'm calling pseudo-CI. So we covered accommodative insufficiency. I'm going to cover accommodative excess. So symptoms, distance blur, particularly after near work, um, headaches associated with your work, eye strain. And for our clinical signs, we frequently find very variable visual acuity and retin refraction that don't make sense. Sometimes some practitioners refer to this as pseudomyopia. Maybe you're having a uh, 20, 30 visual acuity, but we're not really finding anything or retin refraction and vice versa. Things just aren't making sense. Typically find high amps. Patients are going to fail binocular accommodative facility flippers and monocular accommodative facility flippers. Again, it's an accommodative issue. So they're going to fail both the binocular and monocular or your virgence is where they would likely, issues would likely pass the binocular, monocular, but not the binocular. And these patients are gonna have trouble clearing plus on the flippers. And typically they are a little esophoric at near, maybe also at distance. So now I'm gonna go into what's called accommodative infacility. Symptoms include just difficulty switching focus from distance and near, back and forth, difficulty where, with reading, maybe some intermittent blur associated with near tasks. The signs are the patient fails both binocular and monocular, monocular accommodative facility, and you know that the patient can't do either side of the flippers. They're having trouble with both the plus and minus lenses. Their accommodation in either direction is ill-sustained, not able to clear the flippers. So now I'm going to go into some patient cases and we're going to look and diagnose the patients. I do recommend um, maybe you want to have a, piece, a pen and paper for these. If you want to jot down any notes, I'm going to ask you to diagnose the patients after I present the cases. So for the cases, I'm going to present a history, entrance testing, refraction, some maybe additional BV testing. You're going to help me diagnose the patients and then we're going to go through each of these cases. 
So in case number one, we have a 20 year old female that's presenting for an eye exam. She has the chief complaint of blur and eye strain. We're finding that intermittent, the, the blur is intermittent and typically starts maybe an hour or so after computer work. She reports that it's in both eyes, it's constant. She recently switched to a desk shop and she's just having a really hard time with her blurry vision. She's also reporting occasional double vision when tired and she finds relief after taking a break. She does not currently wear any glasses. She's worried about her job performance as a new job and she's just having trouble um, doing it. So in entrance testing, this is what we're finding. Her distance visual acuity uncorrected is 20-20 in both the right and the left eyes. Same for near. On cover tests, we're finding ortho at distance and a relatively high exo, 10 prison diopters at near. Motilities are fine. Push-up AMS are 10 in both the right and the left eyes. And our near point of convergence looks a little receded. It's 15 and 25. So stereo vision is normal, pupils are normal. So when we go to do refraction, we're finding Plano 2020. So we're not finding any refractive error. Patient was 2020 entering visual acuity uncorrected. We're not finding anything on refraction. So then we're going to go do some additional binocular vision testing. So again, without correction, the patient was ortho at distance. 10 XO at near. So we're going to repeat that cover test without correction. Obviously, the patient's playing up with plus one to see what her foria is and assess her ACA ratio. In this case, we're finding 12 prism diopters of XO foria, which gives us an ACA ratio of two to one. That's low. Um, our step virgences are as follows at near, base out. 6, 18, and 4, base in, 8, 10, and 7. Looks a little low. So is shared criteria met in this case? Is this is something we should probably ask ourselves. So the patient is 10 exo. The compensating positive fusional virgins for an exophoria. In this case, the blur was 6. We need at least 20 for the patient to be able to, com uh, to comfortably compensate for that exo, so she will likely be symptomatic. We note that the patient has difficulty on the plus side of the flippers on both binocular accommodative facility and monocular accommodative facility, and she fails the binocular accommodative facility, but she's fine with the monocular portion of that test. So I'm going to ask you to diagnose the patient. What do you think this patient has? Um, I'm going to put up my previous slides so you can see the patient information. And what is your diagnosis? Okay, so we had quite a few answers. The majority said convergence insufficiency. Um, that would be a, a good uh, diagnosis. So we diagnosed this patient with convergence insufficiency. And why was that? The patient had a large XO, receded near point of convergence. They had a low ACA, so you're thinking an insufficiency. They did poorly on tests of positive fusional virgence, and they failed the plus side. They were having difficulties with the plus flippers. AMPs were normal, so we're ruling out accommodative issues. And the patient's finding don't improve with PLUS. So we can rule out pseudo-CI or any accommodative insufficiency. Great job. So let's go to case number two. In this case, we have a 16-year-old female who's coming in for our comprehensive eye exam with the complaint of tired eyes while reading. The patient reports the symptoms occur almost every single day, and it's been going on since the beginning of the school year. She tends to reread sentences. She does wear glasses full time and her um, symptoms improve after taking breaks. She's really worried about her school performance. So we do lensometry on the glasses and find it's minus 225 in the right and left eyes. Here's our entrance testing. So with her glasses, she's 20-20 at distance at near. 
we're finding that she's ortho at distance and she has a large exophoriate near with her glasses. Her amps are 13 in both the right eye. Motilities are good. Near point of convergence is a little receded and then we repeat testing with the red lens and find that she's even more receded. Pupils are good and then her stereo seems to be a little bit reduced. Again, we do an up-to-date refraction, same as her habitual today. So we move on and do some additional testing. On this additional testing, we're finding that she's um, ortho, distance and near, just like when she came in. We're gonna repeat the cover test with the plus one flippers. When we find that she's now a five XO. So when we go to calculate that ACA, we're like, is that five to one? That doesn't make sense. We're using plus one, we expect that XO to get worse, but it's not, it's getting better. So the XO gets better with the plus buffers over the habitual. And then we repeat that near point of convergence with that plus one. And we're finding that that near point of convergence is now five and six, and that improved from 14 to 16. So that also doesn't make sense, right? So we're thinking, we're asking ourselves, what's going on? So what do you think is going on? What is your diagnosis for this patient? And again, I'm going to put up the information if you need it. So what do we have? Large majority um, are saying accommodative insufficiency or pseudo CI. We also have some accommodative excess in the audience. So let's look. In this case, we're gonna diagnose the patient with accommodative insufficiency or pseudo CI. So we're just noting the effect of the plus. So we're initially suspecting CI, they had a large XO at near, receded NPC, and then we retest with plus, and we're looking at the FOIA and the near NPC again, and we're finding that things are improving. So that's not a CI, a CI would do poorly on plus at near. So we're thinking there's an accommodative insufficiency. So we're gonna think about maybe prescribing some plus or bifocal in here. Let's move on to case number three. Case number three is 11 year old female. She's presenting for her first comprehensive eye exam. She was referred after her school screening due to decreased visual acuity. She tends to squint. The patient reports that it's daily, kind of started at the end of the last school year. It's in both eyes and it's all day. She's not really finding any relief when she's taking breaks and the patient's mother reports that she's struggling in school. So we go on to do our entrance testing. We're finding reduced visual acuity at distance, uncorrected, fine at near. Uncover test, again, she doesn't have glasses yet. We're finding three prism diopter exo at distance and 14 prism diopter exo at near. So for you, that's worse at near than at distance. Finding the amps to be 17 in both the left and the right eye. Motilities are fine. NPC with the light target is receded. Pupils are fine. Stereo might be a little reduced, but not too bad. On refraction, we're finding a 1.25 refractive error, both right and left eyes. So we're finding refractive error. We're finding a relatively significant. The patient wasn't wearing glasses. Now she's a minus 125. So let's retest. Let's find out what's going to happen. Maybe this is going to help her symptoms. So we repeat our cover test findings through that trial form. And now we're finding a 4XL just to go back to what she came in. She had a 14 prism diopter when she came in. We're going to repeat the near point of convergence. We're finding that it's improved. Again, she's now two to two break for recovery. Previously, she was 10 and 15. So both the XO and NPC improved. We did trial frame. We went from zero to, went from Plano, no prescription to minus 125. So we can get an estimate of our ACA ratio. Not quite accurate as doing a minus one, but we're gonna calculate that at about an eight to one. She went to 14, now she's four. We're doing this with a 125. 
So that's a relatively high ACA ratio. Um, so we're going to, because she's minus, because she's myopic, we can take advantage of that high ACA ratio to help with her large exophoria. So what is your diagnosis for this patient? What does she have? Great. So the vast majority say there was an incorrect glasses prescription involved, followed by a divergence excess. So let's take a look. Did diagnose this patient with a large exophoria secondary to uncorrected myopia. And then with that correction, they were now within normal limits. So this is why I, I keep stressing the importance of having a full up-to-date fractive correction before we diagnose patients with accommodative anomalies, because we might just find this case. So uncorrected myopia is associated with an exophoria. And we're going to correct that significant refractive error before, before proceeding with testing, and we can take advantage of that high ACA ratio. So she does have a high ACA ratio. Might eventually look at that a little bit closer, do some more binocular vision testing, but today we're going to diagnose with a large exophoria secondary to that uncorrected myopia. So let's think about, take a step back. So our initial amps were 17, both right and left eyes. So what would you predict the amps to be now that she's fully corrected? So now she's minus, we're correcting her with minus 125. So if you want to think about it, she was previously in an add of 125 being uncorrected. So we've got to take that away, right? So now she, she was 17 with full correction. We're going to take away that 125. So now she would predict if we really measured her amps with her new glasses prescription, it'd be approximately 16 diopters. So let's look at case number four. 23 year old black male is an optometry student. He's coming in for a comprehensive exam because he's having eye strain while studying and blurry vis vision at distance after studying. Hat reports this happens multiple times per week and the symptoms have been worse since starting optometry school. He reports the blurry vision is in both eyes, worse at the end of the day. Um, does report that his symptoms are relieved with breaks. He's having trouble studying for his classes and worried about his grades. This is what we're finding on our entrance testing, reduced visual acuity at distance in both the right and left eyes. Patients ortho at distance, five present doctors, esophoria at near, push-up amps are 12 in both eyes, motilities, pupils, confrontation fields are normal. For a near point of convergence, we're finding a, to the tip of the nose and stare who is 30 seconds. On retinoscopy, we're finding a little bit more minus than what we would expect for a 20 30 visual acuity by a little bit. But when we do subjective refraction, in this case, we chose to do a delayed refraction where we're putting more plus, letting the patient sit there for a while. You can also do cycloplegic refraction. As well, we're finding, because we want to take the accommodation out of the picture, we're looking and we're finding prescription to be Plano and a little bit of plus. So we're finding a reduced visual acuity. The subjective refraction's not matching that entering visual acuity. On RET, we're finding more minus. So there's this mismatch. It's not really making sense, the retin refraction and entering visual acuity. So we go on to do more additional binocular vision testing. So we're finding that the patient is ortho at distance, five prism diopters E. So at near, this is when they were coming in. We're going to repeat that cover test through minus one. And now we're finding a 13 prism diopter esophoria. When we do our ACA calculation, we're finding that the ACA ratio is high. It's eight to one. We do our step vergences near base in and base out. Looks maybe a little, it looks a little um, low on base in. Schertz criteria is not met in this case. There's a 13 prism di, I'm oh, sorry, five prism diopter E, so at near we need at least 10 compensating um, base in negative fusional or vergence, and we have eight. So Schertz criteria is not met, so that patient's likely symptomatic, which they are. 
and they're unable to clear the plus side of flippers on both binocular and accommodative facility um, and monocular accommodative facility. So we're thinking there might be an issue with more than one system here. Good. Vast majority is that a, a combination of convergence excess with accommodative excess. So that's what we also diagnose the patient as, convergence excess with accommodative excess. Just to remind you that convergence and accommodative anomalies are often linked, often occur together. So we need to analyze both virgins and accommodative tests. We decided that they were convergence excess and that they had an ESO4 that was greater at near than distant and reduced negative fusional virgins. They had signs pointed to accommodative excess and that they had uh, high amps, unable to clear plus on the flippers. They failed both binocular and accommodative facility. And when that happens, you're thinking, oh, this patient might have a uh, accommodative issue. So let's go into case number five. Nine-year-old Asian female presents for a comprehensive eye exam. Um, comprehensive eye exam after being referred for a school screening. She's having some difficulty seeing small print on the blackboard. She's reporting blurry vision whenever she's looking at distance and she noticed the onset gradually over the past three months. A patient's mother reports she's occasionally closing one eye when looking far away and her daughter appears to be sensitive to bright lights and she frequently closes one eye at distance but is doing very well in school. So in entrance testing, what are we finding? We're finding reduced visual acuity at distance 2060 in both the left and the right eyes. On our cover test, we're finding 16 prism diopters of exo at distance and seven diopters at near in primary gaze. When we do our motility, we're noting a V pattern exo. Um, NPC is a little receded, pupils are fine. And we're finding this when we're doing our motilities. Our refraction is a little on the myopic side. So we put those subjective findings into our trial frame and we're going to repeat the cover test. When we do so, we find that the cover test findings are now better. We're finding seven prism doctors at exo at distance and ortho at near. And now her near point of convergence is to the tip of the nose. So what is your diagnosis for this patient? Okay, and I gave it away a little bit, divergence excess. So we did diagnose this patient as a divergence excess. We found myopia, so we corrected that refractive error before proceeding. This fixed the near point signs, but the patient still had distant symptoms. So we prescribed our findings and we are set to follow up to monitor her symptoms. So on her follow-up, we had the patient returned. She had no near point symptoms, no eye strain or diplopia, but occasionally the eyes drift. So she still has a little bit of those um, divergence excess findings, not so bothersome with the correction. So we're helping her out being fully corrected, but she's still a little bit divergence excess. Okay, I'm gonna go into our last case. This is an 18 year old patient, just started college, and having blurry vision while reading. Patient reports his symptoms start immediately after reading. He reports trouble with close eye, both eyes, and that his symptoms are relieved after breaks, and he has been avoiding reading, and he's worried about his grades. This is what we're finding on entrance testing. 2020 visual acuity, distance at near. Cover test is finding ortho at distance and at near. Push-up amps are low. Motilities are fine. A near point of convergence is to the tip of the nose and stereo is reduced. This is what we're finding for subjective refraction. And so we do some additional testing. So we retest with plus one, we want to know our ACA ratio. We're finding a 
by a CA ratio borderline high of six to one, and we're testing our step virgences. So we're gonna ask ourselves, is the compensating virgence through the plus one adequate to compensate for the euphoria? And it is. So we're finding that he's able to compensate for that six prism diopter. So we might wanna think about, is that plus one helpful? So I'm not gonna ask you this one, but what is the diagnosis in this case? And it's a diagnosis of accommodative insufficiency. And so we tested with the plus one, that's kind of what we were thinking might help the patient to make up for the lack of accommodation and it seems to work. So we trial frame that extra plus and I'm gonna prescribe that for the patient. So just to recap today, that you should be able after today's lecture to identify the compensating virgins for all types of foria and predict if a patient's going to be symptomatic. We're gonna be able to predict the effect of a prescription on ocular alignment using the ACA ratio and calculate the amps when the amps are measured through something other than the best distance for fraction. We also took a look at Dwayne White and accommodative diagnoses. And hopefully that when you are doing patient cases, seeing patients into um, different categories. Do you have any questions? Oh, good question. So when a patient with binocular vision anomaly comes to clinic, do we assess the vision first or binocular vision assessment? So if this is your first time seeing, I would highly recommend doing a full comprehensive exam. We're gonna come up with the update prescription. We're gonna check for any health issues with a dilated exam, and then potentially go on to do a binocular vision assessment or have them back at a later time to do that. So first we need to assess the vision, do the refraction, look at the eye health, and then we can rule out various things and then do our binocular vision assessment. Next question is, I believe, about minus lenses. And minus lenses are gonna stimulate accommodation and convergence. So we might potentially over minus the patient. I think that's what you're asking, that over minus can help stimulate convergence as well. The answer would be yes. And then I got a question, we got to have a question about what age should we still look at the ACA ratio? Um, you can do it in any age, but you just need to compensate and make sure the patient has an up-to-date ad. So if you're having an adult that's having issues, you can do it as well. Good. I think that's it, unless there's any more questions. Um, that looks like it for now. Maybe we'll okay. wait a couple of seconds. Okay. Can, um... I'm going to adjust my light. Oh, for I getting a question on divergence insufficiency and my preferred prescription. I'm going to be covering treatment in part three of my lectures. So I'm going to save um, that question until that date. Um, for my third part, when I cover how to do basic vision therapy and what to prescribe for the common binocular vision complaints. There's a question on, is there any relation between convergence insufficiency and contraceptive pills? To my knowledge, there isn't. I haven't seen anything in the literature about that. Getting a question, if a 39-year-old patient with a myopic, has a myopic correction for distance, but also accommodative insufficiency, what are we going to do? We likely might put them into an early bifocal. We're gonna fully correct them for distance, but they're having problems up close. Depending on their prescription, maybe they can take off their myopic glasses and have a built-in and have some ad that will help them. But I would recommend more bifocal correction where they have distance and then an additional ad for reading. I'll cover this a little bit more in depth, again, when I cover uh, the treatment portion of binocular vision anomalies. I'm getting an interesting question on what would be a good book to read on this topic. I, I like this question. Um, I find um, Binocular Vision by Scheinman and Wick to be very helpful you might look into that. I'm getting some more questions on treatment um, for nematrube or accommodative insufficiency. Do you prefer to give single vision reading glasses or progressive? Again, I will cover this. I will save these treatment questions and I'll cover them in part three. Um, 
it kind of depends on the age of the patient. The aggressive addition lenses are a little bit difficult for thinking about prescribing. Children might do single or bifocals. Oh, another uh, follow-up question on the uh, minus stimulates convergence. Right. If you're fully corrected, you're not over minus, you're not going to stimulate convergence. This is just simply in the context that we have a habitual prescription. We might be adding plus or minus, minus flippers on top of it, and that minus is going to stimulate convergence. Um, again, this is why I always talk about the patient must be fully corrected first, and then we're adding lenses on top of that. We're doing things on top of that to see if there's any issues. And then a question on convergence, insufficiency, and spasms, possibly. Um, first, you got to evaluate and address the CI, and then maybe do um, testing and see um, if there's any spasm related to that. So I think I've answered all questions. Oh. Ah. MEM is great. Um, why not um, with retinoscope? I just unfortunately didn't have uh, time to cover that, but MEM, if you know how to do it, that tests your lead and the lag of accommodation. It's a great technique. I do it quite frequently. Unfortunately, in the context, I only have an hour to spend with you. I wasn't able to talk about that in either my preceding lecture or today, but it's a great test to do. Next question, are convergence insufficiency and accommodative insufficiency common for patients undergoing or, or after refractive surgeries? If they're done correctly, they sh shouldn't, like accommodative and in accommodation issues and convergence issues aren't going to change necessarily as a result of refractive surgery. That's just simply correct, fully correcting the patient. Uh, which treatment is better for spasm, atropine or plus lenses? I'll hold these treatment questions again, like I said, until part three, and I'll answer them more fully in depth at that point. <laughs>